Greetings, everyone. The season is winding down and, and ratcheting up at the same time. Playoff games, intensity is in the air, and we're re reaching, a, approaching a final conclusion to the basketball season. But let's keep going. Let's keep looking at plays. Getting better as basketball officials. How many? Yes, five plays. Stick around. Greetings, everyone. Welcome back. Five Play Friday. We're looking at plays. If you don't know me, my name is Greg Austin with A Better Official. We craft video to help basketball officials get better and take control of their officiating career. Let's start today with a you make the call play, not a play you see every day. What do you have on play number one? Okay, a quick banger, right? Inbound play, player goes to the floor, player receives the inbound pass, goes to the basket, a foul is ruled on our kneeling player. What do you have on this play? Blocking? Make your call, put it down in the comments below and stick around, stick around to the end of the video. We'll look at all of the things on play. Number one. All right, quickly, moving on. Play number two. All right, so what we have here is a one free throw situation. Our trail official, it must be uh, an and one, right? Player has scored the goal, et cetera. We are going to shoot one. This is the first of one free throw. Our thrower violates, and yet the officials give the ball back to the thrower in this situation. Is this the correct ruling on this play? We need to understand when a free throw begins. When does a throw-in begin? When does a jump ball begin? When does a free throw begin? At that moment, there are restrictions on the players in the game. The, a free throw or a throw-in, when we bounce the ball to the thrower and they catch the basketball, the ball is considered to be at their disposal by rule. This player catches the ball, and then when readjusting the ball in their hands, fumbles it, it bounces off their foot and goes to an opposing player in the lane. This is a free throw violation by rule. This is not a do-over scenario. We've got an opposing coach at the other end of the floor who says, wait, 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 what's going on? Why does he get another one, right? This is a violation by rule. Many officials will do be lenient here and do a do-over even after a player has dribbled the ball once or twice. Understanding the rules and restrictions on players, though, is critical. We have some great habits and fundamentals. Our crew is in great position for this free throw. Our lead official does the correct uh, mechanics in this scenario by stepping off the court, off of the, la the lane line extended, Great habits and fundamentals, but this is a free throw violation by rule and should be ruled as such. So when we have unusual plays in the game, such as this free throw violation, we can be very clear. Now, this is the last free throw. How would we resume the game in this situation? 
We need to know that, obviously. When we put a ruling in the game, we need to know how we're going to proceed. The throwing team has... <laughs> <clears throat> In this situation, the throwing team has violated. The opponent will be awarded a designated spot throw-in on the end line nearest to where the violation occurred. So, a play we want to get right in the game. Yeah, good to see it in the wild. Moving on. We're not moving on without taking a moment to thank our tremendous show supporters who help fuel the broadcast. Darwin Sonata. Richard Masterson, Phil Haddad, Isaiah Langlois, and Lada Joe. Much appreciated and much love. You want to support the show? There will be links in all the usual locations right here across the screen, in the show description, in the first pinned comment, and up above. All right, with that, we're moving on to our next play. Right. So I've superimposed a clock to reflect the reality of the play. So this is a block charge play that occurs at the buzzer to end a period. The trail official in this instance says no shot. And then our lead official on the play indicates a player control foul and the player control foul was ruled in the game. So what is the correct ruling? How do we handle this situation? Now, my, my, uh, me superimposing this and adding a, an artificial horn, you know, over the background noise of an NFHS network game that, you know, you know that sound, you know that one. Um, it, it was just meant for clarity on the play. So what would be the correct ruling in this scenario? Right. This would be some, uh, you know, the only thing that's in question is, are we going to assess a foul on a player in this situation? There will be no goal, the ball, you know, et cetera. Do, do, does the foul occur before the ball becomes dead? Right. So when does the ball become dead in this situation? Understanding live ball, dead ball is absolutely critical to being successful as a basketball official. You have to understand live ball, dead ball. So what causes the ball to become dead in this situation? Let's take a look. So let's let's suppose that this, the, the clock is, um, the .06 here is accurate. When does the ball become dead in a situation? right? So there's a couple of things here. Is the try released before the horn or is the ball in the, in the player's hands? And that's critical to the decision on the play. If the ball is still in the player's hand and the horn sounds, the ball is dead. <clears throat> Any contact that would result after this, the ball is dead, after the clock hits zero, any contact is going to be judged on its merits and would be, if there was contact, a normal common foul situation, it would be disregarded by rule unless it rose to the level of intentional or flagrant, a swinging elbow, et cetera, um, or subsequent. So if the ball is still in the player's hands, the ball has become dead. If the ball had left the player's hands, 
the ball would become dead on the foul. Right? An airborne player, the ball is dead on the foul. The foul, though, would occur after the expiration of time, but the ball would still be live, but would become dead um, when the foul was ruled. Now, you might say on this play, as I do, and I was like, that's not a, that's not a charge. <laughs> oh. So, key takeaways on a play like this are, first of all, everybody have an opinion have an opinion. This is an unusual scenario, right? We'd want to go to our lead official and say, hey, let's talk this through, right? So I had uh, I had the, the ball in their hand. Obviously, the trail had the ball in their hand. Now, is this the trail's responsibility on this play using NFHS mechanics? Mm, no. <laughs> oh, let's take a look at that. Let's go here. Right, center has clock here in this scenario. Right, our lead could be indicating um, no goal, no try for goal. I have a player control foul. Not a play you see every day. It would be great to have the actual audio and a better look at the clock. Um, it would be great to have lights on the backboard, all of the things. But a good play to look at, and we really need to understand in officiating basketball, is when the ball becomes dead, right? You have to have that critical skill mm. as basketball officials. Hmm. Why did this sound? Hmm. I don't know. Um, but a great clip. We've done a little, you know, playing around with it to try to uh, accurately assess what was going on on the play. But a great question, right? If this was a play was in the NBA, what would they be doing? They'd be going to the monitor. They'd be lo you know, looking at all these clocks, et cetera, to determine was the shot released, uh, had the ball become dead, et cetera. We don't have that luxury. We're out on the court. We're, we're, all we have is us as a crew, right? So we'd want great communication in this situation. Move on, move on. We got to move on. Next play. All right, a play in the lane, stuff going on, habits and fundamentals. Let's take a look at the things on this play. And what do you see? What's your first reaction on this play? Uh, is this a blocking foul in the lane? We got players go to the floor. One player gets the basketball, seems to be making act action with their hands. We've got uh, off the bench, immediately head coach requesting a timeout from the trail official. We see that. Player's holding the basketball. Player lands on top of them, etc. Our trail of our lead official rather moves in in this sort of volatile situation. And then our center official comes in with information of some sort on the play. A hand up. We seem at the end to be assessing technical fouls on the two players involved uh, by our lead official pointing at both the players. Let's look at the habits and fundamentals here on this play, right? So to me, when I see this play, the first thing I see is our player in white is accelerated going to the floor. Why would they be accelerated in this situation? 
I think they are pulled. I think our defender pulls their left arm in this situation, actually causing them to go to the floor. But we've got players on the floor, a try for goal, player holding the basketball, and immediately goes to a timeout signal, right? I think our center picks up that timeout request. This would be a great chance, right, either from trail to recognizing the request, you know, to come in, timestamp the moment, holding the basketball, timeout, white, but also when we look at the habits and fundamentals here, our center official comes in and our two officials are face-to-face -face like this. Once they're in that situation, they lose perspective on everything that's going on around, right? We want to get to the lead official quickly. We want to uh, you know, talk about what we have. Do we have a timeout being granted in this situation? Do we have a held ball ruling? Do we have any indications from either official about the scenario? Let's see. I think that player was pulled and he should shoot. Right? A hand up. Hand up. No indication. Our lead's in great position. A little too close to the action here. I think we have players talking. Yeah. Be interesting to know what actually was the result of this play. Now, our scoreboard says really close game. Uh, we would assume with a score like this that we don't have a lot of time remaining in this game, but we don't have that information. Yeah, so stuff on this play. Is this a legal guarding action by our player? Is that extended? Yeah, that's a pull down, man. That's a pull down. That's my first reaction on the play. Um, so we have a, a volatile situation on the floor though, and we're in great position as lead. I think our center hurts us by the proximity, right? We'd want to be aware of what's going on in this scrum. We want our trail official to be really aware as well. We've got the whole aspect of don't grant a timeout unless the player, it, we are sure they have player control. Does this player have player control? Yes. Yes, they do. And they then immediately grant, and then the opponent rolls over on top of them. Is that a foul? It wouldn't be a foul to me. I'm granting that timeout to the player in white. I am granting that timeout. They were holding the ball, making a request. White was making a request. All it takes is a moment, an instant Grant the timeout request, sell it. Holding the basketball, timeout white, right? Sell it, sell it. That's what I say on that play, right? But a great scenario to look at, habits and fundamentals. We want to be great in that scenario. We want to be consistent as a crew. So, yeah, a great play to look at. We love looking at these plays like this because they reveal our habits and fundamentals in the moment of critical games. Hey, back at the start of the show, we had that inbounds play and a blocking foul ruled. Let's look at uh, play number one. Let's review it. All right, a short clip, but there's a lot going on here. We've got an inbound play. We have screening action. A player goes to the floor, and then that player, realizing that the opponent is going to the basket, simply on their knees becomes uh, uh, legal, <laughs> and a foul is ruled. The shooting foul is ruled. So there's a couple of things to address here, right? First of all, 
the screening action that leads to the play and then the subsequent play, right? So we've had plays on Five Play Friday where players are on the ground and under the basket and a foul is ruled on a prone player. This is a little bit different, right? Does this defender do anything illegal? Right? You could say, well, wait a minute. Legal guarding position is two feet on the floor (laughs) facing their opponent. They obviously don't have that. But what do they do that's illegal? Are they not entitled to be on the floor? Do they extend their arms illegally, et cetera? Or are they just on the floor in that position? You know, this is not a play you see every day. Obviously, we don't get block charge plays on players who are kneeling on the floor uh, very often. So, even though NFHS has specifically said very clearly, a player on the floor is entitled to that place on the floor. And we've had prone players and players tripping over prone players and fouls being ruled, etc. Some, some may have done that themselves. This seems like a play where our defender has done nothing illegal and they are entitled to that spot. It can be confusing to our brain that, wait a minute, wait a minute. I mean, they don't don't, uh, take the legs out of our shooter, et cetera. They simply start to get up, right? There's no restriction on that. So it's an interesting scenario in that way. I would say I would not rule a foul in this situation if I had my wits about me on this play. But the elephant in the room to me is the illegal screening, right? This play, this defender is tripped by a player extending their leg into their path, contacting them illegally in the leg, causing them to fall. We've got two officials working off ball on this play. This is a play we want to get. It's going to be hard for the lead in this instance, who's got who's dealing with restrictions by the thrower? They've got that th- that defender with their hand up, you know, potentially violating the plane, etc. Um, but this is illegal screening action, right? This player is tripped by a player extending their leg. You could say it's a moving opponent. They didn't give them time and distance. You could say screening from behind. There's in in many ways this screening action is illegal. We'd want to get that on that play. So an interesting play in we have a player, a defender on their knees, right? Not something we see every day. That player is entitled to their spot on the floor unless they do something specifically that is illegal. Did they do that on this play? Not in my judgment. Um, But, you know, it's open to interpretation. Key takeaway here, though, is we have to get the illegal screen in this situation. Let's look at our next play. All right, action. So uh, we could start on a play like this by looking at the position of the crew. Obviously, our trail is much too close to the uh, division line. And we've got our lead working at the lane line extended. This not only obviously puts you in harm's way, <clears throat> but it's a poor place to, to officiate the game. We have a score, which is a Blowout scenario, 38-18, four minutes to go in the third period, right? What are what are we sensitive to in that situation, right? This is an obvious foul by White. Let's say White is our home team. No, 
White is our uh, White is our home team. They are up by 20. We are at Fulton, home of the Pirates. Right? We're we're sensitive in these situations to any sort of taunting action by our team that's ahead and any sort of retaliatory frustration action by our team that's behind, but we're aware that we can have frustration in the game, etc. So, our of course, there was a, a video recently of a lead official um, having a dislocated knee on this exact play scenario, and then resuming the game and fighting through, the, <laughs> popping it back into place. It's like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, um, right? So um, we mentioned previously the lessons we learn um, are. I'm going to go back on that, right? So our trail official ultimately comes in and assesses, appears, a tactical foul. Maybe we could go double tactical here. White's got something to say. Our, right? Our player comes up clapping, etc. I don't, you know, we could go double T in this situation just to calm things down. Let's see what actions occur while the ball is dead. Right? So our lead official leaves the scene a little early. We've got the clapping player going towards his opponent, etc. We're leaving the play a little early. What's the rush? The ball's dead. Um, I think we're in a state where the calling official is going to go opposite. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So what are our takeaways on a play like this? Um, positioning of the crew, awareness in, uh, in a, a lopsided game situation, not leaving the spot of the foul early as the calling official, and being dead ball aware. Of course, our trail official may be in a hurry here because he senses a dynamic between the two players and he wants to get there. Like, yeah, I need to get there. I need to get there and deal with these guys. All right. Double T would be an easy solution in that instance. Right. They both extended a little bit. Would Did it rise to some incredible level? No, but it could be a game management tool in a lopsided situation. Yeah. So that's a good play to look at. Dead ball officiating. God, we, if you are a great dead ball official, man. You are way ahead of the game. It's a fantastic skill, and it's going to prevent so many problems for your you and your crews in games. And if we have habits and fundamentals that take us out of awareness, right? Our lead official on this play is in a hurry to leave the play. Maybe they're thinking about their call. Maybe they're thinking about the fact that their knee now hurts. <laughs> um, but let the play, let the play, the, the, the participants, there's a moment of tension in that moment. Be aware of those situations in the game. Address it. Easy, guys. I see you. Yeah. All right. Good job. Good job, Blue. I got you. Or whatever. Just put your voice in the game at the spot. Don't be in a rush. Then go report. And as the non-calling officials, be aware of what's happening in the game. You know what's happening in our game? Tremendous support from our tremendous show supporters. Who's up on the show supporter big board today? Darwin Sonata, Richard Masterson, Phil Haddad, Isaiah Langua, and Lada Joe. Much appreciated and much love. You want to support the show? Yes. 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 And yes. Much appreciated. Thank you for sticking around to the end of the show today. I've got a request. If you would take just a moment to like the video, it's so helpful for us getting us in front of more basketball officials so that we can all get better together. I have additional video content. I have training opportunity available. I have mad love for all viewers of Five Play Friday, and we'll see you in the very next video. Take care, everybody.